and welcome back to our lecture on human nutrition. Today we're going to be talking about sports and fitness and how nutrition fits into all of that. So let's start out with a couple different questions that you can think about as we're going through the lecture. First thing is you're gearing up to run your first half marathon in a few weeks. From your long training runs, you know that physical and mental fatigue sets in a few miles before the finish. You'd like to try one of the sport nutrition products you've seen on the grocery store. What would you choose to take along during the race to help you make it to the finish line? So here are some different things. You might try the Cliff Shot Turbo Energy Gel with 100 milligrams of caffeine and 22 grams of carbohydrates and some electrolytes or the Power Bar Protein Plus Energy Bar with 23 grams of protein, or try the Power Aid Sports Drink with electrolytes, vitamins, and 14 grams of carbs, or Essential Amino Energy Drink with branch-chained amino, branch amino acids. So just think about it as we go through lecture. Which one do you think would be most appropriate, help you the most to be able to get through this half marathon? So some other things we're going to talk about in this lecture, we're going to talk about physical activity and exercise and what's the difference between the two, and then how much physical activity is recommended by the physical activity guidelines for Americans to reduce the risk of chronic disease, and then try to list the five benefits of regular physical activity that are most important to you. All right, so let's start out talking about physical activity, exercise, physical fitness. So physical activity, exercise, and physical fitness are not the same. When we talk about physical activity, we're talking about any kind of movement of skeletal muscles that require energy. So that could be just, you know, you're outside mowing the lawn or you're uh, pulling weeds in your garden or you're doing other things. Whereas exercise, a little bit different, you're using physical activity, but this is physical activity that is planned, it's repetitive, and it's really meant to improve your physical fitness. So you don't really think about, oh, I'm going to go mow the lawn and that's going to be my exercise for today. That's just something that you're doing, but obviously it does take a lot of muscle and it does take some energy to get that lawn mowed, especially if it's my lawn, because I don't mow it that often and it gets like 10 feet tall, you know. All right, so when we look at the benefits of physical activity and exercise, there are a ton of them. So it's strengthening your bones, reducing blood pressure, helps to increase your cardiovascular function, decreases the amount of lipids in the bloodstream, and that's all important to prevent clotting and clogging of the uh, blood vessels. It aids in weight loss and weight control, and you don't want a lot of excess belly fat because we know that the fat in the abdomen is really different from other fat. It can produce hormones that can cause all kinds of uh, different cardiovascular and um, body health issues. Uh, it increases muscle mass, and of course, if you remember, we talked about before, Muscle is really important because muscle is the main system or organ system of the body that is able to consume fat to produce energy. It improves the gastrointestinal tract paralysis because that's making the muscle stronger and it improves sleep. It, it reduces depression and anxiety. It improves cognitive function, helps you to think better it reduces your risk of different types of cancers like prostate cancer and colon cancer and most likely breast cancer. It improves immune function and increases flexibility, reduces stress, improves your ability to regulate the glucose in your body and more. So those are just some of the things that exercise is helping us with. So how much physical activity should we be having? How much exercise should we be having in a, in a day, in a week? And for really good health benefits for an adult, at least 150 uh, minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. And we're going to talk about what's low intensity, what's moderate, what's vigorous intensity as we go along, okay? 
Uh, 75 minutes per week of vigorous intensity, aerobic activity, or a mixture of both, okay? And then the activity, now this is interesting. Once upon a time when uh, scientists were first doing studies on exercise, they would say that in order to get any type of benefit from exercise, you had to exercise at least 30 minutes, preferably 45 minutes at a stretch, okay, at one time. However, now scientists have found that if you at least exercise for 10 minutes at a time, okay, you're going to get that physical activity benefit. So if I need to do uh, 30 minutes, let's say, then I could do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, 10 minutes in the evening, and I would still get the same benefit as doing 30 minutes in one stretch, which is kind of nice, especially when you're talking about having to work with people who are really seriously out of shape because they don't feel comfortable exercising and it hurts to exercise and they think, oh my gosh, I have to exercise for 30 to 45 minutes. There is no way I can accomplish that. So maybe 10 minutes and they're going to be okay. All right, so now physical activity guidelines for Americans, uh, some of the benefits, okay, so if you're going to want to improve your health, increasing physical activity to 30 minutes a week of moderate intensity is really going to see an increase in health. 150 minutes a week of vigorous intensity, if you can handle it, is really good for your health as well, or a combination of the two. Adults also need to put in to their exercise routine mu excuse me, muscle strengthening activities, okay? And we want to do that two or more days a week. And what that means is, okay, so for our muscles to become stronger, for the muscles to grow, we have to do what's considered anti-gravity exercises, okay? So that's why when we lift weights, we're lifting the weights against gravity, that stimulates muscle growth. When we're pushing something up or we're pushing against something like your lawnmower, again, for instance, that's going to stimulate muscle growth. Uh, this is, scientists have found a lot of this out because of space flight. And one of the things they found is that when astronauts were up in space, for longer than a couple of weeks, they would see muscle atrophy and the muscles would uh, not continue to be as strong. And then, of course, the muscle atrophy also lent to bone weakness and bones became very brittle, which is why when they're up in space, they have an, uh, a, basically a gravity chamber that allows them to exercise while they're there and to keep those muscles and bones healthy. 80% of American adults fail to achieve these levels of physical activity in a week, which that's a lot. I mean, it was really surprising to me when I was reading about this, how many Americans, I guess you'd say, are so out of shape. They're not exercising like they're supposed to. Okay, so when we talk about moderate, vigorous, intensity exercises, okay, so what we're talking about is aerobic activity. Now, aerobic activity means it's making you breathe, okay? And this is aerobic activity that increases your heart rate and your breathing rate. Now, we're gonna talk about what is called a rating of perceived exertion scale, okay? So the RPE scale in just a few minutes. But things that can create moderate intensity aerobic activity would be like brisk walking, dancing, swimming, uh, and then bicycling. But this would be like just bicycling on, you know, the sidewalk or down a dirt road, but not really going uphill, that type of thing. Whereas vigorous intensity, the aerobic activity uh, is going to greatly increase your heart rate and greatly increase your breathing, okay? And it's going to be a seven or eight on that RPE scale. So just keep in mind a five or six is moderate intensity, seven or eight is vigorous intensity when we start to talk about the RPE scale in a couple of minutes. That would include jogging, tennis, swimming. Now swimming, that would have to be continuous laps. So you'd have to be going back and forth and back and forth across the pool, not just little bits of swimming and then bobbing up and down. 
and then bicycling uphill type of thing. So now for muscle strengthening, we talked about you need to do that anti-gravity lifting weights type of thing. And we want to do muscle strengthening where we're increasing uh, not just the strength of the muscle, but we're increasing the endurance of the muscle. So for muscle strengthening, there's two ways of doing this when you increase muscle strength and you increase muscle endurance. So let's just talk about like weight lifting. So you do repetitions with weight lifting or what they call reps. And if you do light weight, many reps, you're going to increase endurance. If you do fewer reps with heavier weights, you're going to increase muscle strength. And that's because when you do the heavier weights and you're doing, I mean, you have to do fewer reps because you don't want to injure the joints, you don't want to injure the connective tissue, you don't want to injure the muscle. When you're doing the heavier weights with the fewer reps, it actually makes the muscle grow. When you're doing the lighter weights with the multiple reps and endurance, it's actually making the muscle healthier, able to use up carbohydrates and fat and oxygen better and the muscle lasts longer. So achieving and maintaining physical fitness. So one of the important things is about goal setting. So why is goal setting important for the success of an exercise program? And what is the FIT principle or the FITT principle? We're going to talk about this. We're going to demonstrate how you would use the FIT principle to make a plan for aerobic fitness and then differentiate between muscle strength, muscle endurance, muscle power. We've kind of talked about that already. And two evidence supported benefits of the flexibility of exercises. So we're going to talk about all of these and provide three tips for a person who needs help with long term maintenance of his or her fitness program. So you should be able to answer all of these. Now, one of the things you want to be able to do is assess your current level of fitness before you go off and do a whole bunch of stuff because you don't want to overdo it, you don't want to injure yourself. And then a lot of times what will happen is people will overdo it at first and then they don't want to do it anymore. They're tired and they just don't want to go out and exercise. So you might want to start by talking to a doctor, have the doctor take a look at you or the person that you're working with because you really don't know what's going on with that individual's health and how well they can or cannot exercise. So men over 40 and women over 50 should discuss their fitness goals with that doctor, okay, that primary care provider, to find out what their body is able to handle. Health problems requiring medical evaluations could include like if the person has obesity or cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, chest pains, arthritis. These are all issues that can be complicated by exercise. So you have to be very careful with this. And then of course fitness professionals can help with a safe and start and realistic goals. So you might want to contact somebody for that type of information. All right, so setting goals. Once you know you can exercise, you're ready to go, you want to set these goals. And really, it's very important to know what you're doing this for. And a lot of people, to be able to set a goal means that you can reach that goal and, um, and you can attain that goal. So you want to choose a goal that challenges you, but you want to be able to choose a goal that is attainable. You can get to the end of this goal. And then you can set new goals. So for new exercisers, like I said, you want to start very slowly. So maybe your goal is you want to eventually be able to run a mile without stopping. And then you can set long-term goals. For instance, okay, initially I want to be able to run a mile without stopping, but my long-term goal is I want to run a half marathon, okay? Uh, these goals are measurable. They're something that you can say, hey, I started out just having to walk and now I can run a mile and I can run this many minutes of a mile and now I'm going to run a 5k and eventually I'm going to get into that half marathon so that 
hopefully helps to motivate the person, helps to keep, keep them focused, and helps to keep them going. Or I've heard people say, uh, well, I have to go to a wedding and I want to look good at this wedding or I'm going to uh, a high school reunion and I want to look good. And so those might be the goals to set. Those might be motivation for somebody. You have to find what that person is motivated to do, what makes them feel like I really want to achieve this goal. And it's not just a short-term thing. It's something that they're going to want to do for a long time. So plan your program, all right? So a balanced fitness program is really important and it includes three key types of activities. So you want that aerobic exercise we talked about, you want the strength training, and then flexibility. And so you're gonna use this FIT principle. Now FIT stands for frequency, intensity, time, type of exercise. So frequency is the number of days per week. Intensity is how hard you're gonna work out. You're gonna look at your heart rate. You're gonna look at what kind of resistance training you're doing. And then how long is each session? And then what type of exercise? Because that's also really important. Do you enjoy the exercise you're doing? You don't, you know, if you, if you hate running and you like riding a bicycle, you don't want to set a goal of I'm gonna run a mile. You want to do that bicycle riding, or if you love swimming, you want to set your goal of swimming a mile or whatever that might be. So make sure that your choice of exercise is also something you really, really enjoy and it's something you can do. So an elements of a well-rounded fitness program, and we'll go through these and then you can build your own fitness program. So frequency would be the best if you could five days a week and then two to three of those days is going to be muscular fitness strength training. Now you want to make sure that you don't do your muscular fitness back to back. So let's say you do aerobic exercise Monday, your strength training Tuesday, aerobics Wednesday, strength training on Thursday. You want to at least skip one day and that's because your muscles need time to heal. And then in between that, you want to do some flexibility things. Now you could also do aerobics or you could do muscle fitness and you could do flexibility on those days as well. Now, believe me, when people are starting to exercise, that five days a week is usually a goal to set and not something that you're going to be able to necessarily do. Sometimes uh, a person might be lucky if they can exercise two days a week and muscle fitness might not come into that right away. It might be just very light aerobic exercises. So you have to work up to this fitness program. Intensity, and we'll talk all about how you calculate this and everything, should be 55 to 85% of your maximum heart rate or looking at that RPE, you're looking at a four or higher. And again, we'll talk about the RPE, that rated, rating of perceived uh, exertion. Uh, your muscle fitness, 40 to 80%, okay, of what's called a one RM. And what this basically is, is it is, uh, allowing you to build endurance so that you get that better, higher strength type of thing. So you're going to do one to three sets of eight to 12 repetitions, okay? So then, and then you're gonna do this of eight to 10 different exercises. So for instance, you'll do, uh, let's say a curl. So you'll have a weight in your arm and you're gonna bring your arm up and you're gonna do this eight to 12 times and then you're gonna stop and probably do the other arm eight to 12 times and then stop. And then do that arm again and that's gonna be your second set. So the first set is doing those curls eight to 12 times. Then the next time you do it, let's say on your right arm again, that's another set, you're gonna do that eight to 12 times. And then you're going to uh, vary the muscles that you work out. Now some people what they'll do is they'll work their upper body one day and then their lower body the next day so that they get, uh, and again, when I say the next day, I mean 
you're still going to do those aerobics in between. So you'll work your upper body, do aerobics, work your lower body, do aerobics type of thing, okay? And then, of course, you want to um, make sure that uh, you're varying even the different, different muscle groups if you're doing upper body or lower body, okay? Just make sure that you're doing that. Um, as far as your flexibility, you want to make sure that when you're doing the flexibility, you're only doing this to the point of tension. So what that means is as you're stretching your leg or you're stretching your arm, you're stretching your neck, uh, you're only feeling the point of tension. You don't want to overstretch. Now, one of the other questions is when do you stretch? And typically it's recommended that you stretch after you've started to exercise, after you've started to heat your body up. So that means, let's say I'm running, I could run and jog just a little bit, uh, maybe I'm jogging just enough to start working up a sweat, and then I could uh, stop and stretch at that point. And many people who are very much into exercise and they're going to exercise for long periods of time, they're going to run for several miles, that's exactly what they'll do. They'll warm up, they'll stretch, and then they'll do their heavy exercise. And then after they're done their exercise, they'll cool down by stretching again. And that way you're making sure that you're keeping the connective tissue very flexible so that nothing tears or breaks as you're exercising. And then with aerobic fitness, you want to do, or you want to work yourself up to 20 to 60 minutes a day. With muscle fitness, you want to work yourself up to those one to three sets of the eight to 12 reps a day, okay? And then for flexibility, you want to do two to four repetitions of eight to 10 different stretching exercises, okay? And try to hold each of those for about 15 to 30 seconds. And then if you're going to do aerobic exercises, we already talked about this, that could be running, walking, cycling, swimming, uh, basketball, tennis, soccer, those types of things, football, those are all aerobic exercises. And then muscular fitness, bench presses, squats, curls, abdominal crutches, uh, those are very good muscle fitness exercises. And then different things like hamstrings, shoulder reaches, side bends, neck stretches, those are all flexibility exercises. Aerobic exercises are there to enhance heart and lung function. That's what they're all about. And aerobic, again, means oxygen. So what's happening is as I'm moving, I am using muscle. Muscle requires a lot of energy to keep going. So it has to have a lot of oxygen. It has to have a lot of nutrients. So how are we going to get those muscles, the oxygen and nutrients, that they need, well, we're going to increase blood flow. And the way we increase blood flow is we have to increase heart rate. So as we move those muscles, the heart is going to start pumping faster, it's going to start pumping harder, and it's going to start moving the blood to the muscles. Okay, fantastic, but what if I'm out of shape? One of the issues is, is that the muscle that also goes out of shape is the heart. So when I first start exercising, one of the reasons why I feel so tired is because my heart is not capable of actually squeezing and pumping as hard as I need it to. It can't make that blood circulate and flow. It can't get those nutrients and that oxygen out to the muscles, and so the muscles become fatigued. So one of the important things about aerobic exercise is it's also getting my heart and my cardiovascular system in shape to be able to pump that blood to those muscles so that those muscles can work harder and last longer. So according to the American College of Sports Medicine, they recommend that 30 minutes of moderate intensity a day, or at least 30 minutes, okay? And that's going to be five days per week. 
Now remember, that can be 10, 10, and 10 minutes, all right? And then we're going to talk about ways to determine intensity and the percentage of age predicted maximum heart rate. That's so that we can figure out are we at that moderate intensity or are we at that vigorous intensity exercise level, okay? And then we're going to go over now that RPE or the rating of perceived exertion scale. Okay, so determining exercise intensity, we want to look at age predicted maximum heart rate, all right? So how you do that is you take the maximum heart rate of 220 beats per minute and then you subtract your age from that. Okay, so let's say that we have someone who is 20 years old. So in order to predict their maximum heart rate during exercise, we're gonna take 220 minus their age. So that maximum heart rate for them is 200. But now the question is, should I exercise to my maximum heart rate or not? Well, again, um, scientists have done a lot of studies with that and what they recommend is that you do not exercise more than 85% of your maximum heart rate because what they've seen is as you increase your maximum heart rate, the um, benefits of exercise also increases. However, if you exercise above that 85% intensity, okay, Point, then the benefit of exercise actually decreases and the body starts to fall apart instead of get better. So if that 20 year old's maximum heart rate is 200 during exercise, then you want to look at how in shape are they? Are they needing to start out at that moderate intensity or maybe even lower than that? Are they intermediate? Are they experienced? And then that tells you the percentage of their heart rate that they should be doing. So for instance, you've got that 20 year old again, that's maximum heart rate of 200 and they're really just starting the program. So they should only be about 50 to 65% of their maximum heart rate. So you're going to take 200 times 50% or 200 times 0.5. And then you're going to take 200 times 65% or 200 times 0.65, which means their maximum heart rate should get somewhere between 100 and 130 beats per minute. And that is going to give them a benefit to the exercise. That so what we see is that someone who doesn't exercise to that 50% of their maximum heart rate, so to that 100 beats per minute, actually doesn't receive very many benefits to their exercise routine and so a lot of times they feel like well this exercise just isn't helping me so getting that maximum heart rate up or getting that heart rate up during exercise is going to be extremely beneficial all right so this is a heart rate chart and you can see where the 50 to 60 percent of the heart rate is going to be the lower intensity we go to 60 to 70 percent uh, which is going to be better for weight control 70 to 80 percent is that aerobic zone now anything over that 80 percent is not considered good to do because you become anaerobic your heart can't keep up you can't pump enough blood you can't get enough nutrients out to all the systems. And so this is actually a negative to the body instead of a positive. All right, so we talked about that rating of perceived exertion scale. And this is what we're talking about here. This is a scale that is uh, gone from basically zero to 10. And zero means that you have no exertion whatsoever you don't feel any exertion. So this is your perceived exertion during exercise. So how hard do you think you're working? So a 10 would be like, that is the maximum level I could ever possibly do. And if you remember when we talked about that moderate intensity exercise, we said that was about a five to six, 
whereas the vigorous intensity exercise was about a six to seven, okay? And so we want to make sure that we feel like we're exerting ourselves, uh, but not overly done. So when we're first starting, you probably want to aim for about a four, okay? And this is where we're going to start to build our aerobic and muscular endurance. You should be working hard, but you at a four should still be able to talk to somebody. So while you're exercising, you're kind of like, okay, I'm really tired, but I can still talk about it, okay? It's what they call the talk test. And if you're exercising harder than this, you don't want to be talking because you can't get that oxygen in in order to talk enough. So if you're exercising too hard, uh, you probably need to slow down, okay? So when we talk about muscular, infit, uh, excuse me, muscular fitness, that encompasses a few things. First of all, we talked about muscular strength, we talked about endurance, and then there's also muscular power. So when we're talking about muscular strength, this is the maximum force that your muscles can uh, exert or do when they're picking up a load at one time. So if I were to ask you to uh, pick up a bag of dog food, okay, for instance, how big or how heavy of a bag could you pick up? Could you just pick up a 10 pound bag? Could you pick up a 25 pound bag? And, or could you pick up a 40 pound bag? And so what you're doing is you're looking to see how much can that muscle or muscle group pick up? So let's go from the dog food to a weight. Could I lift a weight that is 40 pounds? Or could I lift a weight that is one pound? What's the maximum force? That tells me the strength of that muscle. So of course, muscular endurance is how long can that muscle go before it's fatigued. So if I'm going to perform some kind of repeated contraction, so a re repetitive movement on that muscle, okay, how long can I keep this up before the muscle fatigues, okay? And then there's two layers to that. Uh, am I picking something up and doing it over and over again, or am I just moving that muscle without any type of weight in my arm? Tells me a different level of endurance. Muscular power, that combines strength and speed for what we might call an explosive type of movement. So are you jumping? Are you throwing? Uh, are you coming out of a block type of thing? Uh, are you diving into a swimming pool? That's more of what we're talking about with muscular power. So when we're looking at muscular fitness again, we want to include strengthening to our program. And remember, that's two to three non-consecutive days per week. All right, so flexibility exercises. Now, I can't really stress how important this is, and a lot of people leave this out of their routines when they're first starting to exercise. And it's really important because you've got to remember that muscles are attached to bone by tendons. And muscles, those, those muscles, when the bones are moving and you're picking up weights, it's pulling on those tendons. And you also have to know that bones are attached to bones by ligaments. And when you're running or you're moving those bones, it's stretching on those ligaments. And you want to keep all that connective tissue really soft and limber. And you want it to be more stretchy so that it doesn't crack or break. And this allows you to move your joints through the full range of motion. To make sure you're flexible really also helps you with balance and stability. So this is super important as somebody gets older. Number one, as people age, they lose muscle mass, okay? That's a big one. And then they also lose that flexibility. And so it's easier for elderly adults to fall. And then, of course, they become injured. They break things. 
So you want that flexibility exercise two to three days a week, just like the muscle strengthening. And poor flexibility also is linked to chronic pain, like lower back pain especially. By the way, another thing that's linked to um, lower back pain, believe it or not, is very weak abdominal muscles. So you want to get rid of lower back pain, you need to strengthen those abs. All right, so some simple fitness. So here's a girl, Josie, and we're going through her fitness plan. So Monday, she likes bicycling, so she's got a spinning class for 45 minutes, and then she stretches for 20. Tuesday, she does walking for 30 minutes and some weight machines, increase that muscle strength. Wednesday, she's back to the spinning class and the stretching. Thursday, she's walking again and doing the weight machines. Friday, she does some yoga. Saturday, she's outside doing some trail hiking. Sunday, no no exercise, okay? Uh, so she's resting as much as she can. Now, that's a pretty intense, really good exercise routine. Uh, but again, if someone is not used to this, they may only be able to do some type of aerobic activity Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and have to rest in between. So really important that you start out slowly so that you don't injure yourself and you don't become discouraged. So we talked a little bit about warming up and cooling down. Uh, warming up usually begins with five to ten minutes of, like we said, that low intensity or slow jogging or low intensity walking. That allows you to do some stretching to increase your range of mo motion and decrease the risk of injury. Then you have the cool down after you're done. You're still doing a few minutes of low intensity activity. So if you are running really hard, you're going to slow down, run a little bit slower. And then about five to 10 minutes of stretching. Uh, that also helps to reduce any dizziness or lightheadedness a person might be feeling after exercise. Okay. So stick with it. This is really, really important. You have to maintain that exercise program. And of course, that is super hard to do because doggone it, life gets in the way. And so it's hard to keep at it. But you know, it's like you fall off the wagon, just get right back on, okay? It doesn't matter if you didn't exercise this week, okay? You, sh you should have, but life got in the way. It was hard. You had to study, you had an exam, but next week just go for it. Do it again and just keep going. So start slow, make it fun. Try to have different types of activities that you enjoy doing. Maybe you can do it with friends, you can do it with your family. And then, you know, what might be really helpful is to monitor your progress. There are a lot of good apps out there. Um, one app I really like is My Fitness Pal, and that helps you to monitor things. But there's a whole bunch of really good apps. You can get a Fitbit, for instance, and then you know how far you've come. You're able to look back on what you've been able to do. And then if you can set aside certain times of the day and say, hey, look, at this time, I'm going to say this is all about me, this is all about my exercise routine, and I'm going to do this, okay? And you want to, as you make your goals, reward yourself. I don't know what those rewards would be, but I don't recommend a milkshake. <laughs> Just, but reward yourself with something that you really like or something that you've wanted over the years. And now you've reached that one fitness goal and you're going to do this for yourself. And don't worry, again, if there are any kind of setbacks just stick with it, keep going. This is all about the long-term benefits to your health. So energy sources for exercising um, muscles. So one of the things we're gonna talk about is ATP. And I want you to describe one process used to resupply ATP during a short, intense burst of activity, such as a 100 meter sprint. 
How does the ATP yield of anaerobic breakdown of glucose compare to that of aerobic breakdown of glucose? Why is fat a useful source of energy during exercise? And name three types of activities during which fat supplies 50% or more of fuel. And is protein a useful source of energy during exercise? Why or why not? So we're going to go through all of these. Can you answer these questions by the time we're done? So energy sources for our exercising muscles. Now we know that our body makes what's called ATP as an energy source and this is adenosine triphosphate and this is the main energy source for our cells and it is what we would call chemical energy or high, it produces high energy bonds. So it's used by the cells for muscle contraction, it does other things like ion pumping, enzyme activity, it does a whole bunch of stuff for the cells and only small amounts are stored in the resting cell, okay? So you don't have a lot of ATP storage. So ATP is constantly having to be made by these cells. So because we have to constantly make ATP, we also need, and we don't store it, we need other sources of energy. So when we look at ATP, okay, um, what we say is that food energy is stored as ATP. Now, we don't have a tremendous store, but what we're doing is we're basically changing the foods we eat into this adenosine triphosphate, okay? And then what that does is that allows us to use this ATP in order to do work, okay? So simply put, we have energy from food, and that energy from food is allowing us to produce this ATP. And then notice there are what we call three phosphates. Each of these produces a high energy bond. We can break one of these phosphates off and we can give that phosphate to another chemical process in the body and those phosphates create energy to allow those chemical processes to go in the body. When you do take one of the phosphates off of the ATP, then you only have two phosphates left. We call that ADP, which stands for adenosine diphosphate. And there are other videos in this series earlier on uh, that you could go back and look at the production of ATP if you so desire. So we're taking food energy and we're producing ATP from this. And then we're taking that phosphate from the ATP and we're using that to perform what we call work or exercise. So anaerobic metabolism, this is a little bit different because in order to make ATP, now you can make it anaerobically, but we don't make a lot of ATP anaerobically. We need good oxygen supply to make ATP. So basically ATP formed in the muscles from that ADP, so we can take ADP, that adenosine diphosphate, and add a phosphate to it from the food, but in order to do that, you've got to have oxygen around to be able to supply those muscles. Now, sometimes that's, that's not possible simply because we have to have energy quick, really rapidly, more rapidly than we can form ATP. So we have something called phosphocreatine. And what phosphocreatine is good for is this is good for us making ATP energy within like the first 10 seconds of moving, okay? So for instance, let's say that you're inside a theater and you're watching a movie and somebody screams fire and you have to get up and you have to run as fast as you can out that door. Well, from zero to 10 seconds of you moving, your body can't produce in the normal aerobic way, it can't produce ATP. So it's not able to produce ATP through glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport chain. And then again, remember we don't have enough ATP stored. So if I want that quick energy, I'm gonna use phosphocreatine. Now, 
there's two parts to this chemical. There is a phosphate and there is creatine. So what happens is when I'm moving quickly, I use an enzyme or enzymes that is going to actually cut the phosphate off of the creatine. Then that phosphate can be used very quickly to add to an ADP to produce the now adenosine triphosphate. I can use that ATP that has been quickly produced for that first 10 seconds of that burst of energy, that rapid movement for me. Now, you know that um, there are supplements of creatine that are in the stores, and uh, people use this creatine for strength training and to increase phosphocreatine in the muscles. Now, um, there's not much phosphocreatine made or stored in the muscles, so there's a real big question as to whether it helps. And then again, it's not going to help with endurance. It only is used in that first 10 seconds or that burst of muscular movement. So really, is it a waste of money or not? Some people swear by it. Who knows? So this is just a picture showing you that you have ADP and you can take the phosphocreatine, take the phosphate off of it, put it on the ADP, and we produce ATP, which then we can use for that burst of activity. So with anaerobic metabolism, when we're breaking down glucose, this is usually happening when I don't have enough oxygen in my system. So I'm intensely working, I'm intensely exercising, and now I have to turn to anaerobic glucose breakdown. Now, uh, what happens is I'm going to uh, not be able to use that oxygen, and what I typically am able to do is I'm able to, when I have oxygen, break glucose down into a chemical called peruvic acid. But without that oxygen, then what will happen is the peruvic acid is converted into lactic acid. And that lactic acid can start to build up in my muscles. And when it builds up in my muscles, that's when I can have a lot of aches and pains and a lot of problems with my muscles. So if you've ever not exercised for a while and then you got back into it, you might have been like really, really sore for several days afterwards and that's because of all that lactic acid buildup in the muscles. And it's not until the muscles actually over those three, four, five days, whatever it may be, where the soreness goes away, the muscles are actually converting the lactic acid back to pyruvic acid. And then once we convert it to pyruvic acid, we can then use it to make ATP down the line. So what we don't want to do is we, we don't want to build up that lactic acid. Now, unfortunately, okay, so let's go through this again. Unfortunately, when I'm in bad shape, my heart is in bad shape. If my heart is in bad shape, I can't circulate blood well enough. I can't get oxygen to my muscles. Unless I've got that oxygen, I'm going to make lactic acid. So until I get into better shape and I get a better circulation and a stronger heart, I am going to be building up that lactic acid. It's, it's just going to happen. But eventually it will get easier, it'll get better, okay? So what will happen is the blood flow increases, I will produce more ATP, I can replenish that ATP very well with the oxygen. But if I don't have enough oxygen, if I'm still anaerobic, I won't be able to sustain that ATP production. And I have a swimmer up here because swimming is very difficult uh, to do and stay aerobic. You have to make sure that you're breathing enough so that you produce that aerobic activity. So when you have bursts of muscle activity, such as that swimming, okay, you're using ATP, you're using the phosphocreatine, you're using glucose in order to power those muscles. And then to some extent, 
you'll also be using fat, which we'll talk about later. So this is just showing you, again, just in picture form, what we just went over. Glucose in aerobic uh, metabolism is going to produce pyruvic acid, and then we'll be able to make some ATP there. Uh, in anaerobic metabolism, the pyruvic acid will go to lactic acid, and we don't make any ATP. But if we stay aerobic, the pyruvic acid then goes through the citric acid cycle. It also goes through the electron transport chain, and we produce much more ATP. There's some CO2 and some water that's produced as well. Now, ATP formation has to have uh, food, okay? We have to have a food supply in order to produce this ATP. So that food supply are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. We can break each one of those different dietary products down into ATP. So we can break down protein, we can break down carbs, we can break down fat, and we can produce ATP. Now fat, okay, uh, gram for gram, will actually produce more ATP in the long run than carbohydrates and proteins will. But we're going to talk about all of that and what that has to do with uh, exercise, aerobic and anaerobic activity. So if you're looking at this picture and you're looking at dietary protein, and that looks like somebody roasted a chicken, uh, that protein is used for many different things. Uh, one of the things is it helps make body cells and, of course, muscle. You have to think about that is important as far as being produced by protein. Your hair, your skin, that's all produced by protein. And when we eat protein, it's broken down into amino acids. Those amino acids get into our bloodstream, and then those amino acids go into our cells. And inside our cells, those amino acids are put back together to be able to produce a protein. We really don't want to use protein as our primary energy source when we're exercising. That will make sense because if I'm trying to build up muscle and I'm trying to build up strength and muscular endurance, and that includes my heart, I don't want to tear down protein okay, of my body to use it as a... Uh, energy source to make ATP. So I want to try to keep as much protein uh, in my body, on my body, for my muscles and the building of muscles and not divert that to ATP production. So when I'm exercising, I am mainly going to use carbohydrates and I'm going to use fat as my energy source. So when I eat carbohydrates, and it is much preferred to eat complex carbohydrates, because they are going to be broken down into multiple glucose molecules, and I can use that glucose to make tons of ATP energy when I exercise. Fat is going to be stored in body cells, and what happens is that fat, when it breaks down during exercise, is converted into fatty acids, it's converted into triglycerides, and then I can use those both in order to um, make ATP during my exercise process. And we've gone through all of these. Now we will also talk about vitamins and minerals and how they participate in these metabolic pathways as well because they are very important in making sure that all of these food sources produce all of the ATP and build all of the muscle that we need. So first we're going to talk about aerobic metabolism of carbohydrates. So during low to moderate intensity physical activity, okay, so remember that's about that four to five on the scale. Uh, so that would be like jogging or distance swimming, but we're still able to uh, do that talk test, all right? And we're still able to talk to somebody. What we're doing is we're going to um, use what's referred to as glycogen 
that is stored in the liver and break it down into glucose, release it into the bloodstream, and then through all those processes we've talked about, using oxygen, produce ATP. Now, glycogen is where you take a whole bunch of glucose molecules, bond them all together. So you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of glucose molecules all stored as one big mega molecule in the liver to be able to be used when you need it, especially during exercise. So this supplies more ATP, releases the energy actually slower in the process. So this is really important too. You don't want to gobble up all the glucose and produce all the ATP you can right away. You want to slowly but continuously, steadily produce this ATP energy. You don't want it to peter out while you're exercising because then you're not going to be able to go as far. You're not going to be able to have that endurance that you need. So by using glycogen, you release the glucose into the bloodstream much more slowly and you're able to keep that glucose coming so that you can keep on going for your exercise. So about 95% of the ATP made from glucose metabolism will produce CO2 and water, okay, uh, and then ATP as your other very important component. The major energy contribution to activities lasting from two minutes to several hours is that ATP from glucose metabolism. Now, here's the other important thing. If glycogen is the molecule that I need to help me to exercise, to give me the strength, to give me the endurance, how do I make glycogen. How do I get that stored in my liver? That is mainly going to come from complex carbohydrates. You're not going to store a lot of glycogen from simple carbs. The more simple carbs you eat, the quicker that is stored as fat. So if you want to exercise more, you want to exercise longer, you want to become stronger, it's all about eating those complex carbohydrates in order to have that glycogen store. So when muscle glycogen is depleted, okay, this is where our blood glucose levels have fallen and they can fall to very dangerous levels. And this is, for an athlete, what we call hitting the wall. Um, I remember many, many years ago when they had the very first female marathon in the Olympics. And, uh, oh, it was so exciting to watch. And there was one marathon runner. She was just this little tiny thing. She was about five foot three. She was an American. And so, of course, we were all rooting for her. And uh, she just sprinted. I mean, she just was booking and the commentator was saying oh my goodness she's running so fast she'll never be able to keep up this pace uh, eventually all the great marathon runners are going to overstrip her and they're going to beat her and she'll be lucky if she even finishes because this lady had never run an official marathon before she'd never won any how she even got on the american team everybody was very confused but man she was like lightning okay and she didn't slow down she kept running and she continued the whole 26 and a half miles at this unbelievably fast pace faster than they'd ever seen it well eventually all those other world-class marathon runners uh, those ladies saw that they had to pick up the pace and they started running much faster than they normally did and one of the women uh, she must have depleted her blood glucose levels. She just pushed so hard. And what had happened was you could see her, she started running kind of sideways and tilting, and then eventually she fell down and was in a coma. Because blood glucose is needed to power our brains. You have to have a certain level of glucose in the blood to keep the brain going. 
and she had used up all her blood glucose trying to keep her body moving at such a fast pace. So she hit the wall. And of course, paramedics ran out right away. And what they did, it was amazing to watch. They put an IV of blood of glucose, 5% glucose solution into her and her blood glucose levels went straight up and within seconds she popped right up and it was the funniest thing because the paramedic held the IV bag while she continued to run and it wasn't very far and she finished the marathon. But that's what hitting the wall is all about. So you want to avoid that glycogen depletion and you want to have the maximum storage of glycogen when you exercise. Now some people have talked about uh, carbohydrate loading and what that meant is a couple of days before somebody went and did something like a major marathon, they would eat a lot of complex carbohydrates. So they would like stuff themselves on spaghettis and pastas and breads and they would try to make sure that their liver was full of glycogen. However, the issue with that is that carbohydrates also cause the body to retain water. And if you really ate a lot of pastas and everything before you did a long-term, like fast-paced marathon, uh, you might be very sluggish because you have so much retained fluid that you can't move as quickly as the other people around you. So carb loading, eh, probably not what you need to do. So you want to just make sure that you're eating the complex carbohydrates along the way and make sure that you're eating enough of those that the storage of, car of glycogen is high. So in the next video, we're going to talk about aerobic metabolism of fat. So see you then.